Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. And as the grass fades and the flowers wither, but the Lord of the God will stand, the word of the God will stand forever. Amen. When I was a kid, I used to love in the summers to go up to upstate New York, and many of you guys think of New York and New Yorkers as that city place, but New York City is just a small part of the geography, and it's very much country and rural, and there's mountains, and I remember one time a, a squirrel had, had gotten into my great-grandmother's house, a room of all Our places, by and she was so to comparisons. Um, she had come over here from Syria when she... kid had gotten into her room and tore that room up. I mean, every picture was off the wall, perfume bottles knocked over. It was horrific. We laughed at that. We always loved the, the idea of wildlife. And one thing I, I knew in the Catskill Mountains, which were, again, mountains and, and pretty high mountains, just like out here in North Carolina, 5,000, 6,000 feet, there, there's a lot of bears there. And in Florida, I didn't know we had bears in Florida. We actually do, but uh, that's a side note. Most of the time, you don't think of wildlife in Florida like that. And I remember I would go up to the mountains, and I would hear stories of bears everywhere, and I, I would want to see a bear. And the stories would usually go like this. You know they hibernate, and they're, they're rec reclusive in the winter. But in the spring, they wake up hungry, and however that works. But, well, in the spring also, all the people come back to the mountains from the city and all over, and they start opening their houses, and there's really no AC up there, and they have windows open, and they're baking, and they're cooking. And over and over, repeatedly, I hear stories of, of people baking cookies and bear coming up their decks and pushing noses through screen doors and women screaming and the bears going nuts and, and, and running away. And I was always terrified by it, but wanted to see that and experience it <laughs> from the safety of the second floor window. Um, <laughs> You know, and then the thought would always occur, like, what if it got in the house? Like, what if that encounter didn't happen? And it actually, I mean, to get through a screen door would be nothing. And what would it do in the house? Like, what kind of carnage would it do? What kind of things would it break? And horrible messes would it make? And how would you get it out? And what just renovations? You'd need Larry McDaniel there for <laughs> to, do, to do a makeover, you know. And then I thought, you know, that's, that's really what sin is in, in people's lives. Like, like, we can see the really dangerous sins, and we know to keep them out of our, the house of our life. Like, we're not going to let them in, and we might put up guardrails around it. And then when we see people's lives who have been made shipwrecked by sin, it's just so obvious to this. They let the bear in, you know. But I'm like, what, what about Christians? Like, what do we what do? Because do? so often I think we just can see those big red letter sins, those terrible things, but but what about the little sins? Like, do they matter? And I, I tell you, like, when we moved up here two years ago, I mean, in Florida, we'd get lizards in the house. It's the only animal I can think of that came in the house. And the kids would catch the lizards. They could do that. Um, but Susan came running and get me, and she's like, there, there's, there's a rat in the fireplace. And I'm like, a rat in the fireplace? How do you know it's a rat? I hear it banging around and scratching. What else could it be? And we have a, a propane fireplace. So you got to unscrew the glass front, you know. And so I, I, I got like, I'm like, well, I didn't have, they didn't give me rat catching stuff when I was, um. 
And so I, you know, I got a broom. I got a net, like a butterfly net, but wasn't sure that would be big enough. We got flashlights, and I unscrew the thing, and I'm looking, and I'm just waiting for the thing to jump out at me. And we can't, we can't find it because there's so much stuff in there for it to be a propane fireplace. And so I left the room for a second, and I had them keep an eye on it because I was not gonna, we were not going to live with a rat in the house. I mean, it's just a rat. It's not a bear. But we're not going to live with the rat in the house. And so I went in another room, and, and I, I left people there to keep watch but as I went to get whatever else I don't know their flashlight or some maybe a hanger or something I don't know it, I, the kids left they weren't watching anymore and I'm like don't they notice rats gonna get loose and make a mess and sure enough just like that I see this flash go by it was a bird now it had gotten down somehow and so is that any better I mean we like birds I love the birds in the spring here Susan has a feeder she just they they keep eating and we like to watch the squirrels try to get it and fall off the thing, spin around because we have one of those. And uh, we love birds, especially the cardinals. But you don't want a bird in your house, right? I mean, it's a bird. It could be a pet, but not a wild one. And so, like, kids get the net and whatever, and we got the bird out of the house because we were not going to live not only with a rat in the house, we weren't living a bird with that in the house. My point is, why as Christians are we so content with living with birds and squirrels and rats in our own life just because they're not bears? The text is all about sin and judgment and hell. Not popular to speak about today. If you were to read this on a street corner, we'd probably maybe be arrested for hate speech. And yet in many churches today, there's no preaching on these texts and that's why we just preach through the book and when we get to the passage we get to the passage and this is where the Lord has us and so what do you think and what are your first thoughts when you hear if your eye causes you to sin gouge it out and if your hand causes you to sin cut it off and the same with your foot are you thinking of people out in the world or are you thinking about you guys who are we thinking of? We have to be careful when we look at a text like this because the commands of God are real and they're in Scripture, but so often the church in particular responds in wrong ways to the commands of God. Legalism. There has to be a way to handle very seriously what Jesus says here. The word sin is used over and over and over talks about making one of these little ones causing one of these little ones to sin he has a child on his lap from the previous story but the connection was we're all children because we're all his children and so the idea is you don't you don't let lead anybody into sin be better if you were just killed than if you did that death would be better and then he uses that as a segue to talk about indwelling sin in your own life and as I said, there's many ways, many, many ways to get this wrong. And you'll see an outline in your bulletin. And I gave that to Shannon earlier in the week. The destructive power of sin, the desire for eternal life, and the devotion of living sacrifices. And there is a sense that I'm following that path, but I decided toward the end of the week that I was going to address this a little bit differently. Because we want to get this right without getting it wrong. And I found or identified at least four ways that Christians get this text wrong. And one way that's actually from the text that we'll draw out of it that Jesus wants us to get it. And so let's look at that. Four ways that Christians get it wrong and then the way we're supposed to understand this. Just if people are note takers, the first two ways are ways in which we think this doesn't apply to us. And the next two ways are ways in which we no, it applies to us, but we go about it in the wrong way. Killing sin in our life. So like I said, the first way is we think this text is not for us. It's written for unbelievers. I mean, it's talking about hell. And Christians, we know we are secure in the palm of Jesus' hand. He says all that the Father gives him will come to him, and all that come to him, he will not let one go. Rome, uh, John 6, John 10, Romans 8. You are secure in Christ can't lose your salvation so if this is, is is warning us about hell this must mean for the world the world needs to know this the other reason 
that some people think this is for the world and not for Christians is because, you know, like John prayed in that confession of sin or declaration of faith, like we just don't attribute these passages to us because we have in our old self protective faculties that protect us, we think, from having to ever conceive that we might sin or that we've done anything wrong. And so this must be referring to other people. So I'm going to show you this is written to Christians, but first we need to talk about what these words are. And you see over and over, sin and hell, and judgment. What is sin? I heard it said that the more important a concept is in a culture, the more words there will be in that language to describe the concept. And so it's no surprise that in the Bible, there's all kinds of synonyms or phrases to describe sin. There's iniquity, there's transgression, there's evil, there's falling short, there's causing to stumble, there's scandalizing, walking in the flesh, debt, wrongdoing, disobedient, trespasses, offense, guilt, fault, violation, crime, misdeed, unrighteousness. Just to name a few. Contrast that with our culture. Hardly any of those words are used. Sometimes they're used, obviously, in a judicial sense. There is guilt and guiltiness. But we don't use this word sin, unrighteousness, iniquity, transgression, or any synonyms for them, culturally speaking. What do we say when somebody does something that we would call sin? Well, if it's acknowledged as a sin, they made a mistake. Or maybe we use the word, the, the, the language of brokenness. And now I want to be careful here because I like the word broken to describe sinners. I mean, this is, we refer to what the sin in the garden, Adam and Eve, as the fall. And what's, what's brokenness but a fallen state. But we have to be very careful because brokenness is in the passive voice. It's, it's like it's something that happens to you. And while it's true, we are all sinners. We bear original sin and we are sinners or we sin because we are sinners. That, that has happened to us. We are guilty for all of our sins, both sins of commission, sins of omission, sins of desire, and just the indwelling sin in our life. The Bible never excuses it. Society will excuse it. They'll look at things like DNA and psychology and sociology and upbringing and all kinds of social constructs and oppression and all kinds of reasons why it's okay that people have done the things they've done. As if the history of a person excuses what they do. We should know why we fall to sin because that can help us in addressing it, but it never excuses it. The word sin means simply to miss the mark. In English, the word sin comes from a really ancient old archery term. They would call out when, when an arrow would be shot and hit a target. They would call out if it missed the bullseye, sin, missed the mark. Once again, we think of the book of Romans. All have sinned and what? Missed the mark, fallen short of the glory of God. That's the mark. The mark is holiness, God's holiness, and his perfection as described in the law. We miss it. The term used repeatedly in, in our text today, at least four times, maybe five. Four times, I think. Sin is actually a phrase. It's not the word sin, hamartia, which is the typical Greek word for sin. It's a phrase mean, which means causes to sin, which is in our English. So in other words, it takes three English words to say what this one Greek word is. The Greek word is scandalizo, to scandalize, to cause another to sin or to be, cause yourself to sin. You scandalize yourself. You, you lose innocence in that moment. You're scandalized. God's standard is purity and we are not pure. We are dirty. Which means everything we do, that's why Paul says, is filthy rags. Because we are not pure, then we can produce nothing pure. Because out of something that is dirty, you can't get something that's pure. Take a dirty rag. Try to clean something off with a dirty rag. What happens? The dirty rag does not impart cleanness. It just makes whatever else is there dirty. 
God's law requires perfect obedience and we are imperfect in our obedience. As a matter of fact, the Bible says we are hostile to the commands and demands of God. We don't follow them. Even worse, James 2.10 says breaking one part of the law is the same as breaking the whole law. In other words, it's not as if you just committed a little cute bird sin. You just had an impure thought for a second. You didn't actually kill somebody. He says breaking a part breaks the whole. You, he says you think that just you've lusted, but that doesn't mean you've murdered, but it doesn't matter. You've broken the whole law. You understand this from possessions that you have. If you break them, like one of my most prized possessions I broke this past year, it was, it was, it was a crisis in our house. Susan and I had gone to Alaska for a 10-year anniversary seven years ago, and the only souvenir I have left besides pictures is, is a mug, and it is, it's the perfect mug. Do you like coffee mugs? This is the perfect, it's the perfect size weight and balance in the hand. The handle fits my hand really well. The rim is right, and it's the right thickness, and, and it's got a bear on it. And so the theme today is bears, I guess. And it says Alaska. I love this mug. I will wash the mug just so I can use the mug. I only really need one mug, that one. And, and I dropped it off the counter, and it bounced on the floor, and, and it, was, it was all in one piece. I was like, oh my gosh. Thank God. And I picked it up and I saw a little chip this big on the rim, right on the front of the mug, too, right where I look at the bear. And I don't say the rim is broken, I broke the mug. And the same thing happens this past year. We broke our dryer, broke. And, like, we, you know, you can only go so long without a washing machine or a dryer in a house of five. I don't know, this thing's always running. <laughs> And like, how do you research in time to get a dryer? You need it yesterday, right? And so, because it already piled up. And so I think I will go to YouTube and I will fix this dryer. And <laughs> he's laughing. Why? What do you? <laughs> I was an engineer once, man. So I, 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 they say take out the control board. And so I take out the control board. And sure enough, a little trace is cracked. And I, I have a solder, carry. And I soldered that thing and put it back in, and I was a man in my house that day <laughs> for a rare moment. But the dryer was broken. It doesn't matter that a little piece of solder was cracked. The dryer was broken. And when you break the law, the law is broken. Can't use it. It already condemns you. We know this by experience, by the way, from all those ideas. Jesus is telling them and us what the culture repudiates. There is hell and there is heaven. And we all sin. The penalty for that is death and judgment. Culture repudiates it. But it's not loving to tell people their sin doesn't matter. It's not loving. Because the result is they go to hell. Can't make people comfortable in their sin. It's not what we're called to do. We're not called to be jerks about it because we know the world's sins. We shouldn't be surprised when we see what's happening in the culture. Just, this is the world. But in relationship with your neighbors, with your family members, you tell them the truth, loving. Because our text shows that there's two destinations, hell or life. It says enter life, the kingdom of God. The word for hell here is Gehenna. It's a location there. They knew it well. It had a very wicked and horrible history. In the time of the kings, there were periods where child sacrifice of Jewish children were sacrificed to pagan gods on altars of fire. And so when he's, talk when he's talking about fire here, at Gehenna, they know what he means. It's also a garbage dump at the time that Jesus is saying that. And there's, remember, millions of people in this area. And it's burning perpetually. The fire never went out. And the smell never left. Garbage is being dumped in and it's just fire. This is the analogy. Our Bible translates it hell 
all throughout the New Testament. It's used as a metaphor for what hell is. Unending punishment of pure wickedness and pain and suffering. Not popular to talk about. But is there a more important thing we ought to be worrying about? Our world needs to know they are sinners in need of saving. They do. And they know it by experience because we know, have you ever met somebody that's tormented by their guilt for something they've done that's not even a Christian? They get to the point where they've done something that's, that's so bad, maybe they've destroyed a relationship, whatever it is. I, I, I told you the story about the young lady. This was two years ago. You probably forgot. She worked at a coffee shop a block from the church, so we were there all the time. We'd do Bible studies there, we'd always, and we, we loved them well. We loved the servers there. And I could tell there was something wrong with her because she's usually bubbly and energetic and, and happy. And she was, there was something, it was, it was like death. I could see it on her. I just asked her how she was, and she kind of brushed me off. And I said, well, they're busy and whatever. When she went through the, got the line done, she came up to me. I was sitting with another pastor, and she says, C can I talk to you? And I knew it was serious. And I said, yeah, would you like to go outside? You know, she had a, like, are you allowed? She goes, yeah. We went outside, and she tells me how the day before she had just had an abortion. And it, it had rocked her world, like you would expect. But when she had shared that with people, she felt people judging her. And she was real upset, like, you're not supposed to judge, right? And I could tell the more she spoke and the more she was asking questions and the more she was looking for validation in that, the more it was less about what others were saying and the more about how her, her own soul was dying amidst itself, the judgment she felt. Now, the world would say, yes, people shouldn't be judging you. You had to make a tough choice. It's your choice. You know, God loves everyone, would that be right to tell her? And yet, equally wrong to tell her would be to heap the law on her and just leave her in her. And so I just prayed in my mind, in my soul, for guidance. What do I tell this person that is true to the truth, but in a loving way? And sometimes I think we just want to tell people truth. And I looked at her and I said, the reason you're feeling this way, and this is a paraphrase from seven years ago or something. The reason you're fearing this, feeling this way is because you're right. This, is, this was a serious trauma that you've been involved in. And a life was lost. And that's serious. And so, like, telling you to forgive yourself is, how is that going for you? Can you forgive yourself? And she knew she couldn't. And I said, but there is a way to be forgiven and not only be forgiven for the shame to go away, but for you to feel pleasure in life again because you know who you belong to. And I told her about Jesus and I explained that we, that I'm no better than her as a pastor. Do we think that? Do we think that people that commit whatever the horrible sin is you think are no, no worse than you without Christ? And I told her, I'm just like you. But Jesus rescued me, and this is my future with him. And I asked if we could pray, and she said yes, and we prayed, and I don't know at the time that she got it. But she was grateful. And then two weeks later, I went in there. She wasn't there for some reason. And then two weeks later, I saw her, and I walked in, and her countenance was so different. It was like light coming out of her, as opposed to the death I saw the weeks before. And when I got up to her, I said, hey, how you doing? And she goes, good. And she leaned in with a grin and she said, I did it. I placed my faith in Christ. I'm in a Bible study and I'm in a good church and I'm walking with the Lord. Would it have been loving not to tell her? No. And so the world needs to know. But Jesus is not addressing the world here. So I, I, I wanted to clarify that because this is a message for everybody, but who is he talking to? The verse right before the verses that we're in, in verse 41, Jesus says, you belong to Christ. He's talking to his followers. The whole context is he's having conversations with his followers. This is a message for his followers, to his followers. 
It's what it is. The New Testament letters are not written for the world, although they're used evangelistically to the world. They're written to his followers. 1 Corinthians 5, 9, for instance. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not meaning the sexually immoral of the world, or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother, who is guilty of these sins. The New Testament is always speaking to Christians. Why do Christians need to hear this? Approximately 100 years ago, theologian Richard Niebauer described the Christianity of his day, this was 100 years ago, as consisting in a God without wrath, bringing a people without sin into a kingdom without judgment through a Christ without a cross. That was the church 80 to 100 years ago. It could be said today. So the first way is to think this mean, this, this text is for the world when Jesus is saying it to his followers. The second way to get this wrong, is that we think this is meant for the visible church and for carnal Christians, but not for real Christians. Now, what's, what's the visible church? The visible church is anybody bearing the name of a brother, of a believer, of a Christian. There's people in this church right now that don't know Christ. Just the statistics. There's people in all kinds of churches. There's people in all kinds of society that says, I'm a Christian, but they aren't really. And Jesus indicates that. Many, many will say, Lord, Lord, we knew you. And he says, I never knew you. And so these people wrongly assume that's who this is referring to. And yet, if you look at the last verse of our text, we'll get to those salt passages, but look at the last verse. Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. That's the summary of his teaching. <laughs> What's the peace with one another? Well, earlier in chapter 9, there was lots of arguing among them. First, the scribes were arguing with them. Then they're arguing among themselves who's greater, and with that, they're blaming each other, this and that. And Jesus starts teaching them about the sin they're exhibiting, and then he says, be at peace with one another. It's for all of them. First, uh, first John 1.10 says, if anybody says he has no sin, it, he makes Jesus to be a liar. If any Christian says that. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Do you think you stand? Are you so righteous? Are you so holy as a Christian? Take heed lest you fall. Jesus nor Paul nor anywhere do they have that assumption that Christians don't sin. It's the opposite. Put off the old man, put on the new man. Another point here is when Jesus is talking about killing sin, gouging out eyes, cutting off hands, like getting the sin out of your life, this is not what you tell non-believers. And this is unfortunately done all the time. You never tell unbelievers to clean up and come to Christ. That misunderstands the gospel. An unbeliever, an unbeliever has no way to clean up. The gospel is what cleans them up. You point out the sin in a loving way, showing them how it's destroying their life. And don't they care about where they end up in the holiness of God? And then what happens when they see their sin? You don't say, so stop sinning. You say, believe in the one that paid the price for your sins. Then you say, stop sinning. Because that's the Spirit's work. And so often, I think, in Christianity, we expect people to clean up before walking in those doors. And clean up before Jesus will accept them. It's not the gospel. It's another gospel. It's a false gospel. Paul says that, let him be accursed in Galatians. People cannot clean up before they have the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit of Christ living inside them, then they can clean up. And that's us. And little by little, we are called to put to death every last vestige of sin in our lives. If you say you have no sin, then you were glorified. And I don't see it. I mean, you guys, some of you are good looking, but you're not that good looking. <laughs> 
John Owen calls this mortification of sin. I read that, that book um, just last year again, and um, we put the, that's what we do. We're putting to death the sin in the, the indwelling sin that's still there that rears its head. Because we are free from the power of sin as Christians, and we're free from the penalty of sin as Christians, but we are not free from the presence of sin as Christians. One day we will be, but not yet. So two wrong ways to get this is by thinking it's not for us. The next two wrong ways, where we do think it's for us, but then you fall on the spectrum of being an antinomian or legalist. We're antinomian, so they, you think this is just there to remind us that we're sinners, and there's nothing we can do about it, and so we just go about our lives. We don't even worry about our sins. I have no power to clean myself up anyway. Jesus has paid the price for the sins. I just live my life. And so in fancy theological terms, this is called antinomian. Anti, of course, is against, and nomos is law. There's no law. Law doesn't matter. Jesus is just telling you this so that you remember you're a sinner. Of course, Romans 6, 1, Paul says, you know, so what should we say? Should we keep sinning that grace may abound? May it never be. How could you who have died to sin still live in sin? Can't do it. While most of the church in this church, I don't know that I've really met anybody that's an antinomian here that thinks like it's not, holy living is not important. I think in the South, it's kind of the opposite. But practically, this happens all the time. And what do I mean? I mean, practically, I see it all the time where people are sinning through all kinds of ways. I'm not talking about necessarily the horrible sins of the world. Just again, what Jesus is saying here, be at peace with one another. (laughs) But they justify their actions by what they've done because of what happened to them and then therefore as if the sin doesn't matter. That's living practically like this. Does Jesus, to Jesus, this sin is so important, you ought to gouge your eye out. And as Christians, so many are like, eh, but this is why I did it. Christians are not called to excuse their sin. And we're not called to excuse other people's sin. Because that's damning. Do you excuse your sin? Because you know why you did it. Because so-and-so did this, and so you're justified to do that to them. Like one, two wrongs make a right. Do you ever excuse other people's sin? Do you know God n- never excuses sin? Not one sin out of the trillions of trillions of trillions of trillions, however many, not one was excused. Oh, sure, the Bible says that he looked over former sins in the past because he, looking forward to Christ. But every sin is judged, either in the body of Jesus Christ on the cross or in the person who's not redeemed by him. No sin is excused. All judged. We aren't to be made comfortable in our sin. It's just the opposite. We are told these three things. We are told to flee from sin, to confess our sin, and to put our sin to death. We're told to flee from sin, to confess our sin, and to put sin in our lives to death. So flee from sin. Uh, Just a couple of passages. 1 Timothy 6.11. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness. 2 Timothy 2.22. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness. Do you see there's a double movement? You can't run away from something unless you're running to something because you can't put to death one desire without another desire being there. And so this is repentance. The word for repentance is metanoia. Noia is the word for nous, mind, and meta is a change. Repentance is not saying I'm sorry, although it includes it. It's a change of mind. Flee from this and pursue that. We're told to flee from sin. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, 18, same thing. Uh, Ecclesiastes 21, 2, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Flee from sin, like Joseph. The woman keeps wanting him to do immoral things. He flees from her, literally. 
and it cost him everything. He ends up in the prison. We do that. Jesus says it's so serious to gouge your eye out. And we'll look at that in a second. So first is we flee from sin. Second, we confess our sin. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another. And so, you know, we, we are not named by our sins, but we name our sins. And it's interesting that it says one to another, and it says that you may be healed. In other words, that might be, there seems to be a blessing tied to it, but there's, there's a, an internal healing because when you don't confess your sin, when you hide your sin, what is it doing? It's rotting your soul. It brings death upon you. That's why when I looked at, at that poor young lady, I could see she was dead. Don't you want healing? You expose it to light. That's what light does. It exposes. So you confess your sin. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Christians are called to confess our sins. We are told to flee from sin, to confess our sins, and to put them to death. And that's what Jesus is saying. If your hand causes you to sin, put it to death. If your ear, your, not your ear, your eye, whatever, anything. Colossians 3. If you think this is just Jesus teaching it is a metaphor, but just it's just, just some metaphor. Colossians 3, 5 to 11. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Here it is. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. Now get this. In these you too once walked. So that, that's describing your former life. And this is where people say, well, that's the former life. That's not now. But now you must put them all away. That describes your former life. You are a new creation in Christ, but because there's still indwelling sin in you, you put them away. Anger, malice, uh, anger, wrath, malice, slander. Obscene talk. I mean, it goes on and on. At the end of Colossians, you can read that. Sin leads to death. Either kill your sin or it will be killing you. Either kill your sin or it will be killing you. And if you've hidden sin and if you've lived in sin, you know how it rots your very soul. The problem is most of us only view the big bear sins. And we let the birds fly around inside of us like it's no problem. Christ is saying, if you abide in your sin, if you think it's okay to sin, if your heart doesn't grieve over your sin, are you really mine? John 14, 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will. By the way, that's an indicative. It's not even an imperative. This is what it looks like to love me. If you're not keeping my commandments, what does that mean? Maybe you don't love him. This is not works, it's diagnostic. In John 8, Jesus says, I told you you will die in your sins unless you believe me. So you have death and sin connected. And then Romans 5 says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Death and sin connected. In Romans 6, how can we who died to sin still walk in them? In other words, the penalty we deserve... For sin is death, but Jesus dies for our sins so that we can walk in newness of life. So Romans 6, how can we who died to sin still walk in them? So you either die in your sins or you die to your sin. One leads to life, one leads to death. But you can't have it both ways. You can't have Christ die for your sins and continue in them. This is sobering. Because for many sins in our lives, we almost seem powerless against them. And they keep recurring, and they keep rearing their heads. And we make one step forward, and sometimes it feels like we're making two steps back. And so what do we do? Because the Bible promises growth and progress, and that we are being conformed into the image of Christ now. It's not just some glorified state, but little by little, by the Spirit, we're supposed to be improving. And yet often we don't see that. And so it leads to the fourth way we can get this wrong. 
is by saying, well, obviously I need to do this, so I'm going to do it. And then people do it in the flesh and it has the effect of trying to earn righteousness with God. And so it's all focused on sin management. These are the legalists. And so it says, gouge your eye out, cut your foot off. This is like the Pharisees. Like you say, well, if this is, this, if this is a sin to do this, we won't even do this. So there's a pastor out west named Doug Wilson, and he, um, he says a lot of provocative things. I don't always agree with how he says things. But he, he goes on to college campuses, and he'll talk to college students. And he says everything he says is viewed as intolerant. And one guy came up, and he says, well, you believe the Bible's literal, don't you? And he goes, well, of course. Where it's literal, this is what he says, it's literal where it's meant to be literal, but there's metaphors and there's poetry, and there, you have to take it by what it's, how it's meant to be taken. He says, well, what about this? Hey, he says, have you ever lusted? And Doug Wilson, he goes, yeah, I've lusted. Well, Jesus says, if your eye causes you to sin, cut it out. Why do you have an eye there? And so the idea is we obviously are not cutting people's hands off and chopping off, you know. So the connection is, first of all, there is a principle by which, like, if, if you're into some sin, put guardrails in your life to help you not do that sin, even though you want to. You know, porn is the big one, and we, we use this all the time, because there's all kinds of things. Like, you could put software on your phone so it won't let it in. It, supposedly, it's never that good, but, I mean, for the most part. Or you could have an accountability partner, or you could make sure somebody's looking at your internet usage so that you're not doing this sin. If going certain places causes you to sin into certain social situations, don't go there. Yes, and amen, we, 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 we teach that. That's just, that's just good common sense. But understand this. And Doug Wilson answered in this, con in, in, in this way, because this is, this is the truth of it. You know what the problem with if, if, if my eye causes me to sin, gouge it out? I have another eye. And if that one causes me to sin and I gouge that out, will I stop desiring sin? And somehow if my hand causes me to sin, I don't really know how that happens. Like, do you just grab something or I mean, maybe you punch somebody? I don't know. Like, so if I chop my arm off, you know what? I have another one. I mean, this is what we're supposed to think. We're not supposed to think this is we can do this because I have another arm. And you know what? If I punch my brother with this arm and so I cut it off, I can hit him with this one and I can cut that one off and then I can kick him with this foot. And you don't have enough body parts. Because where does sin originate? And that's the point. You need a new heart. And you need a renovated heart. And you need a renewed heart as a Christian. Over and over. Because as I said, we are free from the power of sin and we're free from the penalty of sin, but we are not free from the presence of sin. The Bible does not promise that in this life. And we need a new heart. This is Old Testament and New Testament. Psalm 58, 2. If your heart's in your heart you devise injustice in your hands you met out violence on the earth so your hands do what your heart conceived of Jesus in Matthew 12 34 you brood of vipers how can you speak good when you are evil for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks Mark 7 6 I think quoting from Isaiah these people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me Matthew 15 but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart. It's like if you, if you speak bad language, cut your tongue out. Okay, but it comes, proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. It originates in the heart. Jesus says if you lust, you're guilty of committing adultery in your heart. If you are angry with your brother or you hate your brother, you're guilty of murder. So yes, put practices in place, but Jesus says you're, at, you're guilty at the heart level. And this is why Psalm 51. David, a man after God's own heart. David with the anointing of the Lord on him. And while we do acknowledge a difference between how the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament and the New Testament, for David to be regenerated, he had to have the Holy Spirit. The book of Hebrews affirms that he is a saved brother in Christ by the blood of Christ. So he has the Spirit and he says this, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Renew it. It was there. But the heart gets cold and calloused. Give me that heart of flesh once again. 
We are hopeless because we, have, we are powerless to change our hearts. So put all the practices in place so that you don't bring more destruction on your life. But understand that when you sin and when you desire sin, there's a deeper, deeper issue. And it's one that only the Spirit of God can, can correct in you. That's it. You cannot beat sin by the flesh. So that's four wrong ways and there's one right way. And our text shows it. Did you see it in our text? Probably not. Because culturally we don't see we don't understand what's going on. But this this text flows from last week to this week. It's like it's like this ongoing conversation and it seems to keep changing topics. But really it's the way we have discussions with people when we're just hanging out. And you go from one thing to another. What leads you from one thing to another? There's, there's usually these connections, right? And so they're arguing initially last week about being the greatest, and, and Jesus says, well, he takes a child, and he says, well, be like this child. And so they look at the child. They say, well, like, what about this foreigner? So then Jesus looks here, and he, he's making the connection with the, chil- the children. Whoever causes one of these little ones to, who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to die. So Jesus takes the child that's in his lap and uses that as a springboard to talk about sin causing others to sin, which he uses as a springboard to talk about your indwelling sin. Now, what happens with your indwelling sin? You deserve hell and everlasting punishment. It's described as fire in verse 43 and verse 48. And in verses 44 and 46, which aren't in our bulletins because some manuscripts don't have them, it says the same thing. So now he segues from using fire to talking about salt and fire. Do you see how the conversation moves based on the words? Okay, what's the point? For everyone will be salted with fire. Makes no sense to us. Until you know the Old Testament. Leviticus 2, 13. You shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offerings... With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Now, how, how are offerings offered? They're burned, right? And so when you, when you use, especially a Jewish person, thinking about salt and fire together, they know what they're saying. They're saying that this is an offering. And what does Jesus say here? For everyone will be salted with fire. And particularly, he's talking to them. You're going to be an offering, Living sacrifices. Hebrews 12.1. I'm sorry, uh, Romans 12.1. So my, my point is, what's, the, what's the, the right way? Is to view our lives as living sacrifices. And I'm going to show you why. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. And I know you guys have been taught very well here that when you see a therefore, what is it there for? It's talking about everything Paul has said in Romans for 11 chapters. That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but the grace is a gift through Jesus Christ, the faith in Him. And in Him, you have righteousness. And even though you sin, Romans 7, there's no condemnation. You're a child of God, Romans 8, because the Spirit who lives in you is, is conforming you into Christ's image. Therefore, by the mercies of God, I, I plead with you to present your bodies as a living Sacrifice. That's what Jesus is saying. Be salted with fire. You yourself are a sacrifice unto God. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That when we walk by the Spirit, we are putting to death the deeds of the flesh. Your living sacrifice. This theme is, is all through um, the New Testament. Just a few quick places Galatians 2:20 I have been crucified with Christ I myself have been sacrificed with Christ it is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me and the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me I myself am, have been sacrificed to him and now I walk in him Philippians 1:21 for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'd rather die and go be with him. I mean, and sometimes I, I if not for my wife and my kids, I say that. I was like, just take me home. 
But the life I now live, I live for him. And it's better for you that I, I'm here because I'm preaching the word. That's what Paul says. It's Philippians 2, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. All these verses are saying you are not your own. You are died in Christ alive to walk in newness of life with him because he rose. Living sacrifices. My dad used to tell me before I went off to college or, or and back to college multiple times for, you know, home for break. But, and he would say this in just such a loving way. Because he, he knows what's going to happen out in the world with drinking and immorality and, you know, getting into trouble and whatever. And he, he just looks at me and he says, remember who you are. Remember who you are. Not legalistic. Not saying you better not do this, that, or the other. Remember who you are. And I'll add to that, remember whose you are. The very previous verse to our passages today says, you belong to Christ. How can we who have died to sin still walk in it? We're living sacrifices. If we believe everything, how could we not be? Because we believe everything he tells us because we have a future and an inheritance and it's awesome and why don't we little by little want to be conformed into his perfect image we belong to christ do you want to want to be more like him you know i know we don't we we, we sin because we want to sin even when we say we don't want to sin we it, we're still we, don't, we never do anything we don't want to do just so you know we always choose the option we want more but at least do you want to want to be like him? You may not want to be like him, but do you want to want that? If you don't know what I'm saying, see me later. We do it because we love God, but because he loved us first. And this whole salt and light, and like, you know, salt in that ancient world, you know, it, it had preservative qualities. It, uh, it flavored, but it also had antiseptic qualities. Killed disease wounds and whatever else. In other words, a Roman historian said it was the most valuable thing in, in the world. Soldiers were paid in salt, and if a guy was a worthless guy, they would say he was not worth his, his weight in salt because it was, it was money. And the Dead Sea salt actually would go stale because it had gypsum in it or whatever. I don't know how that works, but it could go bad. And Jesus is saying, what good is it? It'd be, you might as well just throw it on the ground to be trampled on their foot, which they did. Because when salt no longer had any more use for it, for preserving, for flavor, or for antiseptic, they would use it to throw on roads, the way we salt roads, to help soak up moisture and just make a better path. And Jesus says, you are called to be my salt, my preservative qualities in the world, my flavor in the world, and my purifying qualities in the world. What good are you if, if you're living like the world and you're fighting like the world? That's why he says, be, be, be at peace, he says. Jesus quotes this same verse when he talks about you are the light of the world. First he said in Matthew 5, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. What, the point is like, shine your light to the world, but what good is it if it's not light but darkness? Do we want that? Brothers and sisters, when God made humanity, he made us in his image. He called us. He said, this is good. This is good. He looked at Adam and Eve and he said, this is very good. And they sinned and we sinned and, and the image of God is marred in us. So Christ, Jesus Christ, the very image of God comes to show us what we were meant to be. And then Christians are supposed to want to be conformed into that little by little, being back to the perfection that was intended for us. Don't you want to be perfect? I do. I at least want to want that, even when I don't want it. And so as we close, I want to urge you with this because I want to leave you with great hope. I want to leave us with hope because I know it's tough, but, but hopefully it's hope that you belong to Christ, to remember whose you are, and that empowers us to walk by the Spirit and not to do these things legalistically because we want what God wants for us. But look what Paul says in Philippians as I close here. Philippians 1, 6. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Christ Jesus our Lord. 
That as hard as it feels and as sinful as we think we are, he's got us and he will bring us to that glorified point. 